The Sumerian civilization traded via the sea with three important centers, Magan, Dilmun, and Meluha. Magan was the name for the Oman port. Dilmun was the Persian Gulf, and the third was Meluha, from whom they bought lapis lazuli, cornelian, and in their own words, perfect maize wood and perfect abba wood. Meluha was the Sumerian name for the Indus Valley civilization. This part of Indian history had been quite literally buried away under cities and civilizations of the last 3500 years until in 1921 something happened that pushed Indian history in one stroke from the Vedic times back to 3000 BC making it an ancient civilization on par with the ones of Mesopotamia, Egypt and Babylon. It was an English scholar retracing the footsteps of Alexander the Great when he accidentally landed on the remains of the Indus Valley civilization. Some scholars relate Meluha with Mlecha, who were considered non-Vedic barbarians in Vedic Sanskrit. The period when Indus Valley civilization flourished is roughly 3500 to 1300 BC. The first settlement discovered was Harappa and soon enough Mohenjo-daro. which means mound of death more settlements were soon discovered in the region nearly 1500 sites an english writer who saw the remains of the towns of harappa and mohenjodaro wrote that he quote feels himself surrounded by some present day working town in lancashire he thought it was just a 200 year old city because of the modern style of the bricks used he couldn't imagine that it was a 5000 year old city's remains the cities had wide streets for wheeled traffic and pedestrians It was a flourishing Bronze Age civilization. In fact, it was the largest Bronze Age civilization. From the skeletons unearthed, four racial types have been found: Proto-Australoid, Mediterranean, Mongoloid, and Alpinoid. So it was a fairly cosmopolitan society. The growth of the Indus Valley civilization through its time can be traced through three phases: how it started, its peak golden time, and the late, the decline phase of the Indus Valley civilization. So how did it start? It's likely that the Harappan civilization began as sparse farming villages settled oddly near the rivers. They were not very populated. They knew and they used the latest technology of the time like advanced stoneworking, metalwork, the wheel. Over time these villages developed into societies that were better knit together until the time when they turned into fortified cities and systems. The rivers in the region flooded twice a year which made the soil rich and allowed good food production. Since there has been no evidence found of any wars or sieges in the Indus Valley civilization, it's possible that these fortified cities were more for flood control than for protection against attacks. Right from this early phase, they had extensive trade links with the ancient Near East via the land and the sea. This was also the time when they had their own system of writing, which was used to prepare inventory records, trade invoices, seals for identification with fantastic designs on them, and the seals were made of clay and ceramic, of which we found a number in Mesopotamia. That's where we learnt about how much they appreciated the maize wood, the cornelian, and the abba wood that they purchased from the Meluha people, the Indus Valley people. One of their largest commodities for trade with Mesopotamia was cotton from as early as 3500 BC. The Indus Valley people used standard measure for weights using limestone, and they used a barter system for trade, not money. Their writing system was a pictographic symbolic script which is undeciphered till date. So while we do have a lot of their writing, we can't decipher them and so a lot about them is lost. Everything we do know comes mostly from the Mesopotamian records or by interpreting the things excavated. By the time the Indus Valley reached its golden age, the mature Harappan phase, by this time the Indus Valley city started needing better planning, better organized systems from their earlier farming village days. One starts seeing a dense of civic planning from the quality of bricks and city blocks which eerily resemble the patterns of the city blocks of our times good enough to have confused a 20th century english writer into believing he was walking in a 200 year old lancashire town careful forethought and planning clearly seems to have gone into the cities with striking regularity of divisions assigned streets with orientation of all principal streets to the points of the compass from the streets which were all well laid out in a grid system from the width of the main streets which were as wide as 9 meter in some places to 34 meters in others and ran straight sometimes as far as half a mile and intersected at right angles dividing the city into squares and rectangular blocks in 
Outside these main streets were narrow lanes for residential houses. Each lane had a public well and most houses had a private well and a bath. Some of these 5,000-year-old wells are still functioning. Nowhere was a building allowed to encroach on a public highway, as in Sumer. Corners of some buildings, get this, were rounded off so that loads being transported on carts might not be dislodged. Indus Valley people clearly were good civic planners and engineers. The architecture of Mohenjo-daro is plain and utilitarian. There are no sumptuous temples or monuments as in Sumer or in Egypt. Perhaps the aim of the Indus Valley was to make life comfortable and luxurious rather than refined or artistic. From the remains in her Harappa, one can see two sections of their cities, the high and the low sections. The high section where there was the citadel in the west. Here were also other important buildings like the granaries, the workshops, and it's likely that the upper classes lived in this part of the city. In the lower part of the city, common people lived. Their houses were typically two or three-storied buildings with, of course, uniformly sized bricks. Another remarkable feature of the engineering skills of the Indus Valley people can be seen from the fact that the houses were constructed to allow natural air conditioning or cooling by capturing wind. Vanity cases have been found with things like comb, piercers, tweezers, makeup, jewelry, like a bracelet with six strings of globular beads. Rings, necklaces, earrings, bangles, anklets and bracelets have been found made out of gold, silver, copper and shell. From this, one starts to feel their daily existence in this 5,000-year-old city. When we talk about the upper classes and lower classes, it's not exactly in the sense as we understand it today. It seems to have been a fairly equal society. The general impression is that it was a democratic bourgeois economy. There must have been some form of government, but we don't know how exactly it was organized and operated. Because there doesn't seem to be enough evidence to suggest a centralized government system, or even evidence of any kind of royalty. Nothing like a palace has been identified. The largest building at Harappa is not a palace or a temple, but the Great Granary, measuring 169 feet by 135 feet. And a number of public baths have been found across the sites. These large baths maybe were for ceremonial cleansing, but overall, there's no evidence of their religion. Among the things excavated, though, is the Pashupati seal, with a man sitting in a yogic posture with a striking resemblance to the Hindu god Shiva. But overall, there is no religious building ex except a pillared hall, 80 square feet wide, divided into long corridors interspersed with low benches. This may have served as a public assembly, though. The town planning shows systems of adequate water supply. Lamp posts suggest street lighting. They had drainage systems with ditches running under main avenues. Plumbing system as advanced as the one we see in Roman cities. Cultivation was done on an extensive scale. Their diet was naturally comprised of foods grown locally, mostly. So people in the Sindh and Punjab region ate wheat and barley. And the variety of wheat that they ate is the same as the one grown in Punjab even today. In the Gujarat region, their daily diet was rice and millet-based. In the coastal regions, variety of fish remains have been found. They also ate local deer and waterfowl and dairy products like milk and curds. Terracotta and bronze toys have been found from this period, which I'll come back to later. No specimens of ancient clothing sadly have been found, but we can guess from the figurines. They mostly wore cotton and needles have been found. There isn't really an overwhelming evidence of weapons and war remains, which brings us to the late Harappan time when the Indus Valley civilization started declining. And we don't exactly know why. Towards their decline, one starts seeing smaller and more spread out cities. Their international trade activities declined because you see lesser seals. The later levels of the city showed decline of civic authority as buildings were erected in a haphazard manner and encroachment did happen upon lanes. So of course we just have some theories of how they declined. Maybe there were invaders. Maybe there were natural calamities like droughts or earthquakes or change in Indus River's tributaries which may have dried up. We'll never know. And it's possible maybe there was a new culture, new language, new life with the Aryans who laid the foundations of the Vedic period and in today's Indian society. But there are really no signs of force or besiege or fire. I wish I could tell you stories of life as it happened there. But it would all be fiction because we have nothing about the people. We don't even know what they actually called themselves. We can see figurines like this enchanting dancing girl, a 4,500-year-old bronze statue. We call her the dancing girl, but we'll never know what the artist who made her wanted to convey. Was she a real person or was she fantastical? Why did the artist make her the way he did? 
From our 21st century eyes, we see a brave, confident girl standing in a posture that is so real and human, so close to how we stand, and that makes her so human, like one of us. Just how we connect with her across the arc of time. It's remarkable. She does make us think even more. What must have been that Indus Valley society like? How did they think? How did they feel? What did they want out of life? How close to us she is, yet so far. But that's history. I'll see you next Monday.